There has been a long history of cultural and economic exchanges between China and Europe. But do they understand each other? Believe it or not, I never had the opportunity to learn Mandarin. The language barrier is just one aspect. More important is changing people's mindset. Drop to a certain extent prejudgment, biased judgment. Yves Le Terme, former Prime Minister of Belgium, says why strong China-Europe ties matter. Belgium is located at the heart of Europe and is hosting the capital of Europe. I personally consider the European integration as one of the most important elements of progress of the last seven, eight decades. It's only joined by the unprecedented social economic development of China, of your nation. The European integration, peacemaking, and China's development, in both cases, the economy is the engine. Connection is the engine. We have a shared responsibility coming from that. The responsibility we share has to be based and improved based on mutual understanding. A good understanding of Europe and a good understanding of China. When I think about myself, I'm now 63 years old. I had uh, something like 20 years at school from a little boy, pupil, student, university degrees. Well, during the 20 years, during these 20 years, believe it or not, I never had the opportunity to learn Mandarin. I never had mandatory courses on the history of China, a nation that has been dominating during centuries world's history. Well, a European student almost has no opportunity to learn your history. We should change this. I think, for instance, we should offer more possibilities for young Europeans to learn Mandarin. We should make it mandatory for at least having a basic understanding of the history of China and the role it played in the world's history. Last but not least, we have in Europe an Erasmus scheme that is already used for some exchanges, including for Chinese students. I think we should massively invest in it and make it possible for more students from Europe and from China to have a year of learning, a year as a student in Europe or in China, in the other part of the globe. This would increase the mutual understanding. This would be a fantastic asset for these people personally, also for their future. And it would unleash cooperation based on mutual understanding. When I think about mutual understanding, I think about attitude. We should be ready to learn from each other. And that means to drop to a certain extent prejudgment, biased judgment. And it means also the flexibility, be open for learning to know each other and to cooperate. I was in a small town, a small city in the western part of Flanders, in Belgium, the western part of Belgium, called Pitem. Pitem only has something like five, 6,000 citizens. And we were celebrating the memory of Father Verbist. Father Verbist that was born the 9th of October, 1623, precisely 400 years ago. And Mr. Verbist was a very good pupil, was a very intelligent young boy, and he studied and studied and became a monk, but also a mathematician and an astronomer. And his dream was to learn to know the world, was to go out. And at the end of the day, he managed at a certain moment to ship to China, starting from Lisbon with some of his colleagues, colleagues from the same generation, they went on a journey of more than one year and they ended in Macau with less than one quarter of the people that were shipped in Lisbon. He was one of those that survived and started to work in Macau, in Shaanxi and in other places. And at a certain moment, he was, uh, well, he was invited by the then Kangxi Emperor. And Mr. Verbist was very fond of these contacts and he was at the disposal of the Emperor to put his knowledge into trying to solve problems that China was facing. There was an issue with, for instance, the Chinese calendar of 1670, the year 1670. 
And the openness of the Kangxi Emperor brought Mr. Verbist to, at the end, the result of adapting the Chinese calendar based on his astronomic skills. That openness, that flexibility paid off to the extent that Mr. Verbist went through the ranks and acquired high-level responsibilities within the Chinese administration. In fact, there has never been since then a Westerner that came so close to the leadership of your nation, to the leadership of China. And this was based on his open attitude, on his flexibility, on his willingness to adapt. Mr. Verbist became Nan Huai Ren, and Nan Huai Ren is one of the rare people that had a posthumous name change. And he's buried close to the center of Beijing, close to Tiananmen today. That kind of open attitude of Mr. Verbist, of Nan Huai Ren 400 years ago, is sometimes underdeveloped. Well, we have to overcome hurdles. We have to overcome handicaps like the lack of knowledge of each other's situation, the language barriers, the cultural barriers. But crucial is to overcome this, this open and flexible attitude that Nan Huai Ren displayed here in China 400 years ago. The same goes for rebalancing the global governance. We, political leadership in Europe, the European nations, but the Western nations as a whole should be ready together with China to uh, cooperate to rebalance the global governance, to reset the UN system, and to find better ways to give right positions and places for the emerging nations, for the emerging countries. Openness, readiness to adapt, to be flexible. We also share, ladies and gentlemen, a common responsibility, not only in terms of global governance, but also to support the development of developing nations. I was thinking of uh, what I experienced something like uh, 12, 13 years ago when at the celebration of the 50 years of independence of the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, a very vast nation at the heart of Africa, the nation of the future, the continent of the future. And at a certain moment at the end of the parade, when we had seen passing by all kinds of uh, elements of the DRC army and also some other foreign armies, we saw a quite vast number of Chinese people, Chinese engineers and Chinese workers that were celebrated and thanked for their contribution to the development of the DRC through investment in railroads, through investment in infrastructure. It was maybe a little bit earlier than the BRI, but it was done with the same spirit of common development. Well, this is also a lesson. We should join forces to unleash the potential of Africa. We have a dream of shared society, of a common future, a common shared future. Well, this is also in terms of common responsibility to develop the continent of Africa. So to sum up, I think that both our stories, the European integration, the unprecedented socio-economic uh, progress you made as China, these are very important elements of progress, and they are based on connection, on openness, on economic development, and this brings us with a common responsibility, a common responsibility that we will meet if we increase our mutual understanding through better knowledge of each other's language, to better knowledge of each other's history, through exchanges. And we have to have an open mind, the open mind that Nan Hua Ren displayed already 400 years ago in very difficult circumstances. And starting from that mutual understanding and common development and connection between China and Europe, we also have a responsibility to the global governance and to a continent like Africa to unleash its potential, to make the shared societies reality in the future together with these emerging nations. I hope that's a nice agenda for the future, an agenda of peaceful cooperation. I wish you all the best and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.